Brahman, realization is realization of his Sat or eternity aspect. And Paramatma, Paramatman, super, super soul realization is the realization of his Sat and Chit, eternity and knowledge aspects. But the, but the realization of personality of Godhead is realization of all the transcendental features such Chit and Ananda or bliss. In the personal aspect, this is realized in complete form, Vigraha. And so the complete whole is not formless. If he is formless or if he is less than his creation in any other thing, he cannot be complete. The complete whole must have everything, both within our experience and beyond our experience. Otherwise, he cannot be complete. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So, you remember in the last class, we showed the picture of the elephant and the blind man massaging the elephant. Everyone remember that picture? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So here we see Prabhupada's explaining different realizations of the Absolute. Some know the Absolute as Sat, some know it as Sat and Chit, and some know it as Sat, Chit, Ananda. Different realizations. Sometimes we give the example about the train. When the train first came, nobody knew what is a train. And some people just saw the light in the dark. They thought that's a train. Some other people, they heard. Maharaj, not getting voice. Hare Krishna. Can you hear me now? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. So people understand God in different ways. The impersonalists, they only understand the eternal aspect. The yogis, they understand the Paramatma. But the devotees have the full realization of the Absolute. We want to have complete knowledge of the complete. All right? So that's an important point there. We'll read this, someone can read the second paragraph. Srinivad Pranam Maharaj, all facilities are given to the small complete units, namely the living being, to enable them to realize the complete whole. All forms of incompleteness are experienced due to incomplete knowledge of the complete whole. The human form of life is a complete manifestation of the consciousness of living being, and it is obtained after evolving through 8.4 8 million species of life in the cycle of birth and death. If in this human life of full consciousness, the living entity does not realize this completeness, in relation to the complete whole, he loses the chance to realize his completeness and is again put into evolutionary cycle by the law of material nature. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay. So Prabhupada is explaining the importance of the human life, the responsibility of the human life to inquire, to understand. And he explains all causes of incompleteness. When we feel incomplete, it's due to incomplete knowledge of, the, of Krishna. Go ahead, someone else. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Huh? Because we do not know that there is a complete arrangement in nature for our maintenance, we make efforts to utilize the resources of nature to create a so-called complete life of sense enjoyment. Because the living entity cannot enjoy the life of the senses without being dovetailed with the complete whole, the misleading life of sense enjoyment is illusion. 
the hand of a body is a complete unit only as long as it is attached to the complete body when the hand is severed from the body it may appear like a hand but it actually has none of the potencies of a hand similarly living beings are part and parcel of the complete whole and if they are severed from the complete whole the illusory representation of completeness cannot fully satisfy them okay so prophet's giving a, a nice example here to understand the the importance of being complete that the hand very useful but the hand when it's detached from the body is useless one the body i know is works as a doctor and he told me one day they had to amputate someone's limb they had to amputate his leg and after they they cut the leg off they just wanted to get it out it's horrible get rid of it but so long as the leg is attached to the body it's very very Can you hear me okay? Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Guru Maharaj. You're hearing okay. The line is a bit unstable. This is my floor. We have to expect this. Okay. One last paragraph someone read. Hare Yes, Maharaj. Uh, the completeness of human life can be realized only when one engages in the service of the complete whole all services in this world whether social political communal international or even interplanetary will remain incomplete until they are dovetailed with the complete whole when everything is dovetailed with a complete whole the attached parts and parcels also become complete in themselves hare krishna okay. thank you very much we'll go ahead to mantra 1 let's chant the mantra everybody chant together to vasyam vasyam medanam sarvam जगत्यम ओके दिस इज द फर्स्ट मंत्र ऑफ द ईशोपानिषद तो आई थिंक द द इनवोकेशन एंड मंत्र वन आर बोथ द मेमोराइजेशन टेक्स फॉर दिस बुक they are the most important very important so you don't have much to memorize by way of slokas here just is to in the well known simple ones so isha we said isho panishad isho panishad what is the meaning it me near the lord like the lord sorry what what is the meaning sitting near the lord thank you did you get the article yes yes you, yes maharaj you... uh, yes maharaj okay i hope you managed to read it okay did you find it helpful the article maharaj yes maharaj uh, Yes, Maharaj. It's well written. Okay, so Isha Vasya. We're going to hear about the importance of Isha Vasya. Isha Vasya. What is the meaning? Controlled by Lord. Okay. If we have an Isha Vasya society, then what does it mean? a society with god in the center based on god or god consciousness so isha vashya and then first the first half of the mantra is saying isha vashya midam sarvam yat kincha jagatyam jagat meaning everything animate and inanimate meaning everything 
that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. That's a very big statement. Nothing is actually ours. Everything is controlled and owned by the Lord. We're very insignificant. We are also controlled and owned by the Lord. All right, then the second half of the verse. Dena chak dena bunjata magadaha kasha svitanam. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself, which are set aside as his quota. And one should not accept other things, knowing well to whom they belong. So taking our quota, tena chak tena bunjitaha, we should accept only what is actually ours. <laughs> of course, this, this, is a, this is an interesting question. How do we know what is our quota? We'll talk about that in a little while. Let's go through the purport. Someone can read, please. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Vedic knowledge is infallible because it comes down through the perfect disciplic succession of spiritual masters, beginning with the Lord himself. Since he spoke the first word of Vedic knowledge, the source of this knowledge is transcendental. The words spoken by the Lord are called a Paurusheya, which indicates that they are not delivered by any mundane person. A living being who lives in the mundane world has four defects. One is certainly to commit mistakes. Two, he is subject to illusion. Three, he has a propensity to cheat others. And four, his senses are imperfect. No one with these four imperfections can deliver perfect knowledge. The not produced by such an imperfect creature. Vedic knowledge was originally imparted by the Lord into the heart of Brahma, the first created living being, and Brahma in his turn disseminated, disseminated this knowledge to his sons and disciples who have handed it down through history. All right. So we're hearing the history, the the history of the Vedic knowledge. And first of all, we hear how the Vedic knowledge is apurushaya, meaning infallible. We have to accept it without any argument. And we, we gave some examples of that. Prabhupada was giving some examples of the infallibility of Vedic knowledge when he spoke which is there in the introduction to the Vedas, the introduction essay. What were the examples he gave about the infallibility of Vedic knowledge? Recognizing Father. What? Recognizing Father. Well, uh, that's not the one I was, it's not what I was thinking of. But rather, the example in the Vedas, taken from the Vedas, anybody else know? Yes. What? Cow dung and cow urine importance. Yes, right. That's what I was thinking, right? The Vedas, the Vedas say cow dung is pure, but we all consider stool to be impure. If you touch it, we want to take a bath. We're contaminated. But the dung, the stool of the cow, very pure. No one may speculate and say, oh, if the, cow, if the stool of the cow is pure, the stool of the brahmana should be more pure. That's speculation. That's not Vedic knowledge. Right? We have to take knowledge from the Vedas. And what's the other example? 
रेडियो स्टेशन द वॉइस फ्रॉम द रेडियो स्टेशन महाराज no the, the other example about something from the vedas which is remains pure generally the bones yeah, bones of conscious. conscious right the conscious yes the conscious we keep the conscious on the altar but bones are not pure but the conscious is okay so this is a, based on vedic knowledge so we accept the vedas as being infallible knowledge and then prabhupad goes on to speak about how the vedic knowledge was passed down to brahma into the heart of brahma and then from brahma who got next narada after brahma narada and after narada vyasadeva vyasadeva right so like that came down to vyasadeva and vyasadeva He wrote the Vedas down for us. Okay, go ahead. Someone read. Hare Krishna, uh, Maharaj. Since the Lord is Purnam, all perfect, there is no possibility of His being subjected to the laws of material nature, which He controls. However, both the living entities and inanimate objects are controlled by the laws of nature and ultimately by the Lord's potency. This Ishopanishad is part of the Yajur Veda, and consequently, it contains information concerning ship of all things existing within the universe. Hare Krishna. So there are four Vedas, Madhuri. Do you remember the name of the four Vedas? Yeah, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Athar Veda. Yes, right. So this is Yajur Veda. some upanishads and in others okay so this text this uh, section is certainly stressing the position of proprietorship who is actually the proprietor that's always a big issue it's going to be discussed in this text the, the, you know all the wars and battles which go on it's all about proprietorship who owns it <laughs> ultimately it all belongs to krishna okay someone else read thank you shwa the lord's proprietorship over everything within this universe is confirmed in the 7th chapter of the bhagavad gita 7.4 and 7.5 where para and apara prakriti are discussed the elements of nature earth water fire water ether mind intelligence and ego all belong to the lord's inferior material energy that is apara prakriti whereas the living being the organic energy is is a superior energy para prakriti both of these prakritis are energies or emanations from the lord and ultimately he is the controller of everything that exists there is nothing in the universe that does not belong to either the para or the apara prakriti therefore everything is the property of the supreme being thank you so you you studied the bhagavad gita so you remember 74 describes the elements of the material nature earth water fire air ether mind intelligence and false ego all together these eight comprise my separated material energy and then The next verse says, "Apariyamitas tvanyam prakritim vidime param, jiva bhuta mahabaho yehi dam daryate chaga." Do you know the meaning? Anybody know the translation? Or you can explain. You can explain the verse. apart from the apart from the inferior energy there is a superior energy who uh, utilizes the um, uh, resources of this inferior energy yes actually it says they are exploiting the resources besides this energy of mind there is another energy which are all living entities who are exploiting the resources 
Later on in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhutana, Jiva Bhutta Sanatana, Manasastani Indriyani, Prakriti Stani Karshati. Lord Krishna is saying, the, the living entities are all my parts and parcels, and they're struggling very hard with the five senses in the mind. Why are they struggling very hard? Well, mana shastani indriyani prakriti stani karshati. Why are they struggling so hard with their senses in the mind? Because they're trying to exploit the resources of material nature. Yayi dam daryati jagat. They're thinking mine. They're thinking this belongs to me. This is, a, this is why prakriti stani karshati, why we're struggling because of this, these attempts to be the proprietor and to increase our dominion and control. We don't recognize the Lord. Okay, go ahead. Hare Krishna. Because the Supreme Being, the Absolute Personality of Godhead, is the complete person. He has complete and perfect intelligence to adjust everything by means of his different potencies. The Supreme Being is often compared to a fire and everything, organic and inorganic, is compared to the heat and light of that fire. Just as fire disturbs, distributes energy in the form of heat and light, the Lord displays his energy in different ways. He thus remains the ultimate controller, sustainer, and, and dictator of everything. He is the process, possessor of all potencies, the knower of everything, and the benefactor of everyone. He is full of inconceivable opulence, power, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So Srila Prabhupada is describing here the position of Lord Krishna and why he is God. Why he is the absolute personality of Godhead. He's describing to us his completeness. There's the energy and there's the energetic. Right? So we heard about the energy. The prakriti is Krishna's energy. There's para prakriti and apara prakriti. Right? The para prakriti is the superior and the apara prakriti. The living entities are the superior, the paraprakriti, right? And the aparaprakriti, the material nature. That's the energy. But Krishna is energetic or the, abs the absolute personality of Godhead. Notice there's no mention of Krishna, not mentioning any name of God. We're just talking about the personality of Godhead, the absolute truth, like that. Because this is the Upanishads. So we cannot just immediately talk about Krishna. We're talking about Vedas, Vedic knowledge, these things. So using the term absolute, the absolute truth, the personality of Godhead. So there must be a person that was established earlier. Why, why must there be a person? Why must God be personal? What's one argument to that? Anyone? Why is God personal? Hey Krishna, if there is creation, then there should be a creator. Okay. That's one argument. I was thinking of something else, which Prabhupada had mentioned earlier. Someone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
yes we can have a relation with the lord with the person as a person we can have a relation we have a uh, different kind of relations like father relations or well we could we could say that's just your illusion we could you know people could argue against that they say that's just your illusion i don't have any relationship with him you know it's not a very good argument to convince someone but in prabhupada's purport prabhupada gives a good argument to establish uh, god yes we are part and parcel of the supreme lord so anu and vibhu we're part and parcel so what so the relationship is eternal like the we are anu and his vibhu we are part of the supreme lord part and parcel of the supreme lord yeah i don't know if that is a very convincing argument you know if you're talking to someone who has some doubts about god you want to be able to impress upon them with some good logical argument so prabhupad earlier said is it because we are persons so god must be everything within our existence and more that we can't be something god is not if we are persons and god is not a person then we we have something god doesn't have we are, we are, I mean, we are a personality we have a person and god is not a person that means he's lacking but we said god was complete he's complete so he should also be a person and what about the impersonal then yeah he is that too he's both person and impersonal he's everything within our experience and beyond it so i think that's how we want to try to present the argument the because we are person so god must also be a person but he's not a person like us he's not an imperfect addition he's a perfect addition he's a perfect person we are imperfect additions we have our defects god doesn't have any defects he is a perfect person all right does it make sense yes ma'am yes, yes. okay someone else read next hari krishna maharaj one should therefore be intelligent enough to know that except for the lord no one is a proprietor of anything one should accept only those things that are set aside by the lord as is quota the cow for instance gives milk but she does not drink that milk she eats grass and straw and her milk is designated as food for human beings such is the arrangement for uh, arrangement of the lord thus we should be satisfied with the with those things he has kindly set aside for us and we should always consider to whom those things we possesses actually be, belong are krishna okay so so uh prophets giving the example about the cow and the cow so kindly takes some grass but gives milk now of course we got people like vegans today and the vegans say no you can't take that milk they say but but it's cruel they say that milk is meant for the cow but actually for the calf to take the mother's milk from the cow it's not good for the young calf the young calf will, if it takes too much milk from the mother for too long won't be good for the calf there's a certain point where the calf is not supposed to take the milk from the mother cow but the cow can still give a lot of milk and that milk is meant for human consumption 
So Prabhupada is arguing like this that the, the milk is a is provided for the human beings. And the cow, he, she's satisfied when she gets her grass and she provides the milk. The cows don't do anything. They're, they just sit all day, drink some water, eat some grass, and they give some milk. They give the most valuable food. So this is the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. He provides these things. And we see Lord Krishna himself, he grew up in the, with all the, the cows in, in the village of Vrindavan, where his father had so many cows. So this is the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. We should be satisfied with what has been set aside for us. And we should always consider to whom those things we possess actually belong. So we say ultimately Krishna is the proprietor. Prabhupada is going to expand on this more, this point of proprietorship. It's the main point in this first mantra. Please read this next paragraph. Take, for example, our dwelling, which is made of earth, wood, stone, iron, cement, and so many other material things. If we think in terms of Sri Ishopanishad, we must know that we cannot produce any of these building materials ourselves. We can simply bring them together and transform them into different shapes by our labor. A laborer cannot claim to be a proprietor of a thing just because he has worked hard to manufacture it. All right, that's a, a, a nice example here because we, we do see, you know, the, maybe the, the, the craftsmen, the wood, the, the, the woodcutters, the joiners, they come and they make things for the home. And they may make furniture, they may make a bed or a chair, wardrobe, so like that. So, you have to purchase the wood for them and give it, and then they'll make it for you. But they cannot claim that this is mine. We have to pay them for their work, of course. But at the same time, because you purchase the wood, belongs to us. So the buildings are there. In every building, so many different elements are there. It's all provided. Who provides it all? Where do they, these things actually come from? You can't manufacture them. Prabhupada had an interesting pastime with one man, came to visit him, and he was a life member coming to Mayapur. And uh, Prabhupada met with him. So Prabhupada was asking him, what is your business? So the man said, Oh, I have a glass factory. So Prabhupada said, oh, really, glass? And then Prabhupada asked, how do you make glass? So the man went on to describe how you get sand and you heat the sand up and the sand will melt and you can make it into. So then Prabhupada asked him, where do you get the sand from? And the man said, well, I have a mine. We have land and I have a, a sand mine there. We dig out the sand from the ground. So Prabhupada said, yes, whose sand is it? And the man said, well, it's my, my sand. But, but Prabhupada said, oh, really? Who put the sand there? And so then the man understood what point Prabhupada was making. And he said, well, well everything belongs to Krishna. <laughs> you know, the man actually admitted, he said, yes, everything belongs to Krishna. So then Prabhupada said, oh, everything belongs to Krishna. You're taking what belongs to Krishna. And one of the devotees was sitting there and he said, he's a thief, Prabhupada, he's a thief. <laughs> so Prabhupada said to the man that he says that you are a thief. <laughs> so the man, he's a, he was a life member. He said, oh, he said, but Prabhupada, 
I also give donations. I give donations to the temple. <laughs> so Prabhupada said to him, then you're just a little thief. <laughs> so like that, you know, proprietorship. Who is the real proprietor? We may construct something, but ultimately, where does it come from? In Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a chapter called the Bhumi Gita. I think it's the 11th canto or 12th canto. They're fighting over the land. Different kings are fighting over the land and they're dying, they're killing each other. Mother Bhumi is laughing at them that these kings are so foolish that they're fighting with each other, killing each other for the land. The land is still here and they're all dying. They're, they die and they can't take anything with them. The land is still here. So this is the foolishness of the human beings, and their desire for proprietorship. This is my next person. Somebody can read. In modern society, there is always a great quarrel between the laborer and capitalist. In this quarrel, this quarrel has taken an international shape, and the world is in danger. Men face one another in enmity and snarl just like cats and dogs. Sri Isopanishad cannot give advice to cats and dogs, but it can deliver the message of Godhead to man through the bona fide Acharyas, the holy teacher. The human race should take the Vedic wisdom of Sri Isopanishad and not quarrel over material possessions. One must be satisfied with whatever privileges are given to him by the mercy of the Lord. There can be no peace if the communist or capitalist, capitalist or any other party claims proprietorship over the resources of nature, which are entirely the property of the Lord. The capitalist cannot curb the communist simply by political maneuvering, nor can the communist defeat the capitalist simply by fighting for stolen bread. If they do not recognize the proprietorship of the Supreme Person and Godhead, all the property they claim to be their own is stolen. Consequently, they will be liable to punishment by the laws of nature. Nuclear bombs are in the hands of both communists and capitalists. And if both do not recognize the proprietorship of the Supreme Lord, it is certain that these bombs will ultimately ruin both parties. Thus, in order to save our themselves and bring peace to the world, both parties must follow the instructions of three Isopanistas. Thank you. All right, so Prabhupada is bringing it to an international level now, this question of proprietorship, that we see a lot of tension in the world, even today, different nations. And what is the problem? Often over proprietorship. This land is my land, or this part of the sea belongs to my nation, my country. And in, in this way, wars are taking place. It's a whole history of the world like that. People fight over who is the proprietor. Invaders come, they want to be the proprietor, they want to take control. So Prabhupada said, he said, fighting for stolen bread. They're fighting for stolen bread. It, 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 <laughs> the communist, Prabhupada talked about the communists, he said how they used to get people to join their party. They would come to people and they would say to them, oh, you pray to God, huh? Why don't you pray to God? Ask your God to give you bread. So the people would go and pray to the God, pray in the temple. 
and then they come out and then the communists would say, well, did God give you any bread? And they said, the people would say, no, we didn't get any bread yet. So then the communists would say, then ask us. So they'd say, the people would say, my dear communist brother, can you give us bread? And the communist man would immediately bring in all the bread, big truck with all the bread, distribute loaves of bread to everyone. And this way people thought, oh, communists are greater than God. But they should ask, who gave you the bread? My dear communist brother, where did you get your bread from? Who gave you the wheat? Who gave you the power to cook the bread? Where did you get the water from? Nothing is actually yours. It all came by the grace of God. But people are not trained to see that way. They're all blind, blinded. They just want to be proprietors. So Prabhupada said like stolen bread. Just uh, he talks about another another example Prabhupada gives. It's about thieves. A gang of thieves go and steal, and they have a lot of stolen property, and then they go off together and they sit down. And then one of the thieves says to the other thieves, "Let's divide everything fairly." <laughs> so, you know that. They stole everything and they talk about being fair, being honest, divide it fairly. But it's all stolen. So where is the question of honesty and fairness? It's not there. So we want to be peaceful. We have to recognize the actual proprietor of everything. And that is the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. He is the actual proprietor. And when we recognize him, then there is actual peace. Read some more. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Human beings are not mean to quarrel like cats and dogs. They must be intelligent enough to realize the importance and aim of human life. The Vedic literature is meant for humility and not for cats and dogs. Cats and dogs can kill other animals for food without incurring, incurring sin. But if a man kills an animal for the satisfaction of his uncontrolled taste buds, he is responsible for breaking the laws of nature. Consequently, he must be punished. All right. So we see the difference between human life and animal life. That the humans, we are responsible. We have to follow laws. Animals, no problem. They're animals. They don't have the same responsibility. We have to understand the responsibility in the human life. There's no sin for a dog, but there's sin for man. So people are not aware of this, the responsibility of human life. We just want to be like animals. They're thinking, just enjoy it. So there are laws for human society. Laws are there for humans. The laws are for, not for the cats and dogs. Gover government makes laws for human beings. And similarly, there are laws of God, the supreme laws, the laws of the universe given by God in the form of the scriptures. Go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tandavat Pranam. The standard of life for human beings cannot be applied to animals. The tiger does not eat rice and wheat or drink cow's milk because he has been given food in the shape of animal flesh. Among the many animals and birds, some are vegetarian and others are carnivorous. 
but none of them transgress the laws of nature which have been ordained by the will of the lord animals birds reptiles and other lower life forms strictly adhere to the laws of nature therefore there is no question of sin for them nor are the vedic instructions meant for them human life alone is a life of responsibility thank you yes human life life of responsibility tiger it says a tiger i don't know i heard the tiger can also one man told me well i heard the story it was concerning one of the sons of bhakti vinod thakur the youngest son of bhakti vinod thakur lalit prasad and one devotee told me that he'd met lalit prasad and he saw how lalit prasad was living in a place he was living at birnaga near mayapur in bhakti vinod thakur's residential house not so near mayapur halfway between mayapur and calcutta and uh, it's a kind of remote place so he asked him he said do any wild animals ever come here so he told him well a tiger came here he said there was some famine or some drought or something and at one point tiger came here and it came in and it had half a bag of rice <laughs> so I, i was just remembering that today when i read this about the tiger doesn't eat rice i wondered if it's if it really it really applies all the time anyway in general the tiger likes flesh he wants flesh he likes to eat some kind of flesh and uh, that's the food the quota for the tiger but not necessarily for human beings human beings have a different kind of responsibility we're not we don't need to be carnivorous tiger usually dogs like that they you know they like flesh but human beings they can live without it okay go ahead hari krishna maharaj it is wrong however to think that simply by becoming a vegetarian one can avoid transgressing the law of nature vegetables also have life and while it is nature's law that one living being is meant to feed on another for human beings the point is to recognize the supreme lord thus one should not be proud of being a strict vegetarian animals do not have developed consciousness by which to recognize the lord but a human being is sufficiently intelligent to take the lesson from the vedic literature and thereby know how the law of nature are working and derive profits out of such knowledge if a man neglects the instruction of the vedic literature his life become very risky a human being is therefore required to recognize the authority of the supreme lord and become his devotee he must offer everything for the lord everything for the lord's service and partake only on the remnants of food offered to the lord this will enable him to discharge his duty properly in the bhagavad gita 9.26 lord directly states that he accepts that he accepts vegetarian food from the hands of a pure devotee therefore a human being should not only become a strict vegetarian but should also become a devotee of the lord offer 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 the lord all his food and then partake of such prasadam or mercy of the lord only those who act in this way can properly discharge the duties of a human life those who do not offer their food to the lord eating nothing but sin and subject themselves to various types of distress which are the results of sin bhagavad gita 3.13 hari krishna okay so shrila prabhupada is arguing to us telling us it's not enough just to be a vegetarian you have to also offer your food to krishna not enough just to be a vegetarian you have to be a devotee that's the point so <laughs> very 
powerful and convincing arguments by Srila Prabhupada in this mantra, first mantra. Prabhupada said, if we, if, we don't, if we don't offer our food, then we eat sin. Of course, that's stated in the Bhagavad Gita. Verily, they eat only sin. Devotees of the Lord partake of food offered in sacrifice. Right? We, do, we offer our food in sacrifice. By offering it to the Lord, that is our yagya, that is our sacrifice. We have to recognize him as a proprietor. Of course, there's always questions about how long do we need to offer it and you know what do, where to, where do we need to offer it? And what to do if I eat outside? And so many different issues come up. But the con important thing is the consciousness. We have to recognize that everything belongs to Krishna. So when we eat food, it's Krishna's food we offer to him. All right, go ahead. Next, this, finish this mantra one. Hare Krishna Maharaj. The root of sin is deliberate disobedience to the laws of nature through disregarding the proprietorship of the Lord. Disobeying the laws of nature or the order of the Lord brings ruin to a human being. Conversely, one who is sober, who knows the laws of nature and who is not influenced by unnecessary attachment or aversion is sure to be recognized by the Lord and thus become eligible to go back to Godhead, back to the eternal home. Hari Bol. Thank you. So we see <laughs> a powerful uh, presentation of what is sin, disobedience of the laws of nature through disregarding the proprietorship of the Lord. This is sinful. Generally, we think sin is simply, oh, meat eating, intoxication, gambling, illicit sex, this is sinful. But here, in a, a general way, Srila Prabhupada was saying, the root of sin is disregarding the proprietorship of the Lord, who, is actually, who it actually belongs to. Of course, we cannot, we are, we're often easy going about this. We say, well, it's Krishna's, everything is Krishna's. Sometimes in our temples, not so much nowadays, but in the past, I remember when we were, when we were much more of a ashram based rather than congregation. Nowadays, you know, not so many devotees live in the temples, but in Srila Prabhupada's time, Many devotees did live in the temple, and we were often doing things like book distribution, and we would have vehicles, the temple would purchase vehicles, which would be used by the devotees, and they would go and travel in different places using the vehicle. And one of the problems was devotees didn't take care of the vehicles. They didn't you know, they'd forget to put water in the battery, they'd forget to check the tire pressure, they'd never service the vehicle, they would get so many parking tickets, never pay them. It became a big problem. What, what, what was the problem? The devotees were thinking, well, it's Krishna's car, it's not my car. You know, when it's your own car, you take a lot of care of it. You really worry about it because it's your own. But when you think, well, it's Krishna's, it's not mine, it belongs to the temple, then the tendency is not to take so much care of it. So, of course, it shouldn't be like that. That's a problem. But we do have to recognize Krishna as the proprietor. And we should take care of it because it is Krishna's. And Prabhupada certainly liked to see that the temples were well taken care of. Whenever he would come to the temple, he would often, he would first go to see the deities, of course, and see the temple room. When he would come to Mayapur or Vrindavan, he'd walk around the temple, check out the property, make sure everything was being maintained nicely. 
not only Mayapur and Vrindavan, in other places also. He was very much concerned that the devotees would take care of Krishna's temples, make them nice, make, keep them clean, because he wants, he, he wants, because Prabhupada saw them as, first of all, as Krishna's temple. And he wants also people coming that they will see that the place is well maintained, it's looked after, very important. Okay, are there any questions on this first mantra? Of course, it, the big question is, I think, how do, how do we know what is our quota? <laughs> that we should only take our quota. Anybody would like to answer this for us? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranam at your Divine Lotus Feet. Maharaj, uh, am I audible, Maharaj? Yeah, I'm hearing. Yeah, please continue. Maharaj, our quota, uh, I assume like uh, we cannot buy, we do not have any measurement or any barometer to find out our quota. It no. depends, depends on our past and present karma. Yeah. Well, certainly, whatever we get could depend, it depends on our karma. We can certainly, that's a fact. We agree to that. So somebody has good karma, somebody has bad karma. So somebody gets more, somebody gets less. Yeah, all and it could be also collective karma. It could be also collective karma. Collective karma mean from the Collective nation combination like suppose uh, myself or we are in one family suppose myself my wife or kids and uh, because some of the good things might be my three other family members have done it because of their good karma or their sukriti I'll be also benefited as a collective karma yeah all right so so, yes, so it's very difficult to specifically specifically to say what is our measurement of the uh, of that. Uh huh. What about people who are, uh, you, you people who are, maybe not so honest, that they they're good at cheating and lying, and they make a lot of money. It is their previous birth, obviously. Definitely, it's from previous birth they are carrying it. So this, this is all the. This is not their karma. This is their karma. Yeah, definitely, this is their kar karma from their previous uh, previous birth, which was left over and that which is they are enjoying in this life. Uh -huh. and, and at the same time, also not necessarily that enjoyment will be. Uh, uh, delivering uh, enjoyment because that enjoyment could be also entangled with other problems or other karma. No, if it's everything is if everything is just karma, then we, we don't need to do anything. We just need to sit back and wait for it to happen. No, that is which is I wanted to say the next step. My next uh, uh, statement, like uh, suppose uh, we can change our karma through our devotional practice. And at the same time, one is one option. Second option, that which, which would be like, uh, because of our endeavors, because of our endeavors, jo, 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 dante. whatever the way people want, I can give them in that way. So this is also, if I have intention in that way, what I want, and I am I'm trying my best so long, so Krishna will give me according to my endeavors. It's vis-a-vis, -vis, basically. Well, somebody may be endeavoring, but they may not get. The yeah, uncertainty. Because the endeavor is not going to it's not going to make a lot of difference. You know, we see a lot of people are endeavoring, but it doesn't mean they all get what they're endeavoring for. 
Uh, here right. I am blank, model. Here, yeah, here I am blank. And I am also uh, guessing. Sometime uh, from uh, we have seen that incident. The earlier somebody was so devoted for some other the reason they left from devotion. They engaged in materialistic life heavily. So because what devotional practice they have done it, even although they left the devotion, but that uh, devotional practice when they used to do even material engagement time, they have got the privilege or they have got the benediction for that spiritual activities they have done even within this time of life. Yeah. Okay, karma. Yes, karma is certainly there. It's a factor. Our quota will be influenced by the karma. But, mm -hmm. but when it comes to uh, recognizing our position in the world, and our status, how much to endeavor, how much to, you know, can we just say, well, it's my karma? Of course, we still have to endeavor. We still have, if we don't endeavor, you're not going to, you may not get anything. You could, you're just going to say, well, it's my karma? No, of course. There has to be some endeavor on the part of the individual. And it should be honest endeavor. That's important point. Honest uh, endeavor. Honest endeavor. And also, another thing also comes, if suppose a Mahabhagavata or a very highly enlightened devotee comes, uh, appear in his, uh, in his uh, um, vicinity, because of him, they get a lot of also spiritual advancements or they got also advantage, uh, good fortune. Yeah, contact with a pure devotee. Very yeah, contact with a pure devotee. Yeah, Mahatsevam Dwara Mahur Vimuktis, right? Opens the door. Open is a Mahavam Mahabhirap. Yeah, what is that? Chaitanya Charitam, there's a particular slow. Uh, I'm trying to recall. Like when, um, um, uh, like when, uh, uh, it's a Lila of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, because of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, Marti, even, uh, what is the, uh, Maharaj, I forgot, when he was, uh, the thief was got bewildered, Mahaprabhu sit on his neck, I forgot the story. Mahaprabhu sat on his neck? Yeah, Mahaprabhu sat on his neck, then the thief got bewildered, and then brought back Mahaprabhu again in his place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when so he was a child. When he was a yeah, child. Yeah, when he was a child. Yeah, when he was a child. That's what I'm trying to say. When he was a child, means Mahaprabhu was set on his neck. So that thief, he is a good thief. He, his intention was too bad. But because of Bhastya Mahaprabhu, he got benediction. Yes. Right. That's the mercy of the devotee and the mercy of the Lord. Correct. Special. Special mercy. Yes. yes. So but, that's why but, our quota is very difficult to identify. Uh -huh. Here we're just speaking about general quota, you know, pure devotee, a contact with the pure devotees and with the Lord, then that's very special. That's going to be very different. That's not material. It's not ordinary. But according to laws of material nature, quota, everyone has their quota according to, as you say, karma, according to their past deeds. Somebody's got good karma, somebody's got bad karma. But we've all got some quota. Quota means space for living, for eating, for sleeping, acting. Everyone's given some facilities. Some people have better facilities and some worse. Not, but people want to, they like to improve their quota. They often feel they don't have enough. But one of the qualities of the mode of goodness is that you, we should be satisfied. The brahmana particularly, who is supposed to be the symbol of the mode of goodness, he, he, he is, he, he's satisfied. He, he will be satisfied in whatever situation. 
he'll be satisfied with whatever is achieved without too much endeavor, without great endeavor. At the same time, one should not be so lazy that he sits back and does nothing. One shouldn't be a madman working 24 hours a day trying to get what's really beyond his limit. At the same time, one should not be totally lazy. There has to be that balance. You have to, the, you know, don't work too much, don't work too little. There must be some part, some effort on the part of the individual. Greed also can be considered. Yeah, well, greed can be there dovetailed in the service of Krishna. Greed for material things, that's the pr a yeah. problem. Yeah. If you have... For example, it was like a, a, bus, a sack of rice on the road and comes, takes his portion, you know, the bird yeah. takes their portion. But if, if a human being goes, he may carry the entire sack at home. Right. Yes. Good example. <laughs> the human nature, greed. Look, would the ladies, any lady like to say anything? How do you feel about quota? I mean, how do the ladies find it? Are you usually all satisfied? Are you happy? You don't complain to your husbands, right? Marajis? We want the ladies also to contribute in this discussion. Can you hear me? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so are you all happy? Are you all satisfied? Have you got your quota? Yes, Madam. Really, yeah? <laughs> You're lucky. Very nice. Your husband's lucky. Sometimes, you know, we get some. Sometimes it's difficult to keep people happy. You don't have enough. The children want more. Yes, ma'am. The children, I need this, I need that. You know, very hard to keep people satisfied, to think they have their quota. So anyway, that, that idea of quota, well, it should it should come without over endeavor and with honest endeavor and is that don't also put quota, huh? Is that what we desire that also come under quota? Means we should desire for uh, supreme lord, not material. Well, we have to have something material. Everybody needs something material. You have to maintain the body. You have to maintain yourself. You have to eat. You have to sleep. You have to have a home. You know, the, the, we have to recognize the basic needs of every individual. But we can be satisfied with what we have rather than the... Um, Yes, if you, if, if you can be satisfied with what you have, that's very nice. But not everybody is. Yes. We have to understand what, you know, how, how to, you know, to be satisfied with what we have. And, you know, that's easier for some people than for others. If you have a, if you have a quite a nice standard of living, then it's not difficult for you. But for somebody in a in a in maybe in a harder situation, more difficult economic situation, it may be very difficult for them to be sat to be satisfied. So much, you know, so much anxiety, so much stress. The husband saying, Oh, I have so much stress, trying to take care of my family, trying to please them and keep them satisfied. They feel I don't have enough. They're not satisfied. The school is not good enough. Dhanush Pram Maharaj, can I add something? Please. If we go as per Varnasram, and if 
person stays with the krishna consciousness at uh, at different stages of life when is brahmachari for him his quota is to live in krishna consciousness learning about the krishna consciousness once he enter the grihastha ashram he can maintain his uh, family and uh, he can support the society whatever whatever is there that is his quota which he can use for the krishna's uh, purpose propagating the name of krishna when he goes to vanprastha uh, he does not require that big uh, quota of the things but uh, then it is sustaining himself and what he can support to society that is the his quota basically so things which are sufficient to sustain his uh, life and he can uh, do the devotional service to krishna yes if someone is a very very strong devotee if they are very strong in their krishna consciousness then they can think like that but not everyone is in that situation you see that's a very idealistic situation for most people it's not going to be enough you know, most people most people are not going to think about vanaprast <laughs> maraj but as a devotee we should unless we understand this that is our quota we can't uh, think progress in uh, krishna consciousness and devotional service yeah but well, maybe that's why this is the first mantra that we should get this right at the beginning because this is so important mm. of course the problem is you know this attachment to the body and the senses we're very we're very dedicated to satisfying the body and the senses so right in the beginning the ishopanish had established who is the proprietor that everything belongs to god nothing is ours we come to this world with nothing and we leave with nothing but in the course of our time here we claim so much i know one devotee you know he told me he came to the middle east he came to the middle east he he brought with him just a small bag very little he came with a, but when he went back to india just a few years ago he went back to india with his family resettled in india after being in the middle east for many years he had two containers <laughs> you know you come with nothing but you go back you go back to india so much you know <laughs> so this is this is the the situation <laughs> it's difficult to know uh difficult to control ourselves we have that tendency you know we just have that tendency yayi dam daryate jagat but that we're thinking this this material energy is mine because we have dominion over it what is the difference between the two prakritis one is para prakriti one is apara prakriti why is one superior to the other what is the difference Maharaj, sorry could you please repeat the question once again Yes I want to know what is it why is the, the you know one one prakriti is called para prakriti and the other one is called apara prakriti para prakriti means the living entities and the apara prakriti is the inner matter the 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 you know the building the table the chair these things are you know their matter material material what what's the difference why are the living entities superior uh, developed consciousness maharaj maharaj yes right prabhu they are conscious we have consciousness right that's the difference our consciousness so we are given dominion we have control over them we can adjust them you know you can you can break your house you can redesign it you can you can change the color of your car you can change the seats in your car you can do so many things 
the living entity is superior. The problem, but we are thinking it's all for my, it's all mine. We don't see Krishna. We don't see God behind it. That is actually all His, and we are also His. We've forgotten that. So that's that's gone. So Ishopanishad begins right away, bringing us to the this important point: who is actually the proprietor, and who's behind everything. Hmm. Are there any other questions or comments on this? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have one question. Uh, this is Tyagatena word, no? the, the allotted word, uh, allotment. This also has a meaning of renouncement or detachment. You know? In second chapter, uh, it is uh, interpreted as uh, a detachment. I couldn't hear everything you were saying. The, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, the, the word, the, the word in the verse, Tyagatena. Oh, Tyagatena. Uh -huh. In the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, uh, the meaning is uh, detachment. Uh -huh. But here we are saying that it's an allotted uh, benefits. Or allotted here property. we're saying set apart, quota. Yeah, quota. Well, you see, that's the position of the Acharya, because Prabhupada is the Acharya. You know, words in Sanskrit can have different meanings. Just like the word Atma can be body, it can be mind, it can be soul. So Chagat Atma, the Chagat Atma, the, according to how the word is used and the circumstances, the situation in which the word use, is used, will have different meanings different implications okay. so we have to be faithful to the translator the Srila Prabhupada has given us these words he's given us the meaning like this okay. so he understands the actual intention behind the behind the sloka oh the contextual meaning yeah yeah we have to we have to accept that he knows exactly what is the, what's the in, implication, what's the intention here. And we have to take it from him. Okay. Of course, uh, just like Bhagavad Gita, you know, sometimes it, devotees, they were reading Bhagavad Gita and uh, the, the translation was the same. The impersonalist translation of the Bhagavad Gita and the Vaishnava translation was the same. And they, they said to Prabhupada, say, Prabhupada, your verses, your translation is just the same as the Mayavadis. He said, yes, but the purports are different. You have the Vaishnava purport. So that's very important also. You have to hear from the Vaishnava to understand. So even with the, the, the words here, in the verse, you know, we have to understand these verses in relation to the purport. Prabhupada's purports are very, very important for us in understanding the meanings of each text. So, as he says, this particular first verse is dealing with the question of proprietorship. And then also, quota taking what is actually ours, not taking more. And just like Prabhupada talked about food, that we have, we know what is the proper food. Food is there, there's enough grains, there's enough fruit, there's vegetables. Why do we need to eat animal flesh? That is the point Prabhupada's making. That we don't need flesh, animal flesh. That's for certain animals. But Human beings, civilized human beings, they don't need it because they have enough. There's no deficiency in the diet of a vegetarian. Of course, some people, not everybody knows how to cook, how to cook a balanced meal or how to prepare a proper vegetarian meal. This is one of the problems we face in introducing Krishna consciousness in countries 
where vegetarianism is quite new, like countries like China or Russia, these kind of places, you know, people are not so familiar with being a vegetarian. They don't know. They think you just eat rice and green vegetables and green leaf, just some green leaves and rice. They think it's starve. It means starvation. They think it's, you know, just a, some kind of great austerity. But being a vegetarian, taking Krishna conscious food is not really an austerity. Rather, it's a great pleasure. There's so many nice preparations. And we offer them all to Krishna. So that's our quota, taking prasada, food offered to Krishna. That's part of our quota. Now, as far as, as, far as uh, living standards, they're going to vary. You know, just like somebody, somebody may be in a managerial position, then he will have to have, you know, a bit more. Maybe he has more, more suits, maybe has a bigger car, maybe has to have a, a bigger home because, you know, he's the manager, he's in that kind of position. Or maybe he's doing business. Maybe he's a partner in the company or something. So then naturally he'll have a bit more than others. Than somebody who's just an ordinary worker in the factory. He won't, you know, just like we know, they have the labor camps and people living in the labor camps, they live in very basic primitive conditions. But they're happy. Prabhupada told us about Mahatma Gandhi, how in Gandhi's time, if you people just simply wanted roti, kapre, and makan, right? You get your chapatis and you get your cloth and you have a roof over your head. What more could you want? <laughs> right? That's quota. So when, when Prabhupada started the Krishna consciousness movement, that's how it was. Devotees would live in the temple and they were given prasadam and they were given some cloth and they would work for the service of Krishna. So that's basic quota. But not everybody's satisfied like that. Some people need more. Certainly you have a family, then you have to have a home. You get met, people get married, the wife needs a home. The woman wants to have her own home. She can't just live with all the other women. She needs a home with her husband. Then children come. Then children need things. So, this way the quota. What is the quota? Try to provide for everyone. Uh, Maharaj, uh, I have a, uh, a curiosity, a question is arising in my mind, which is uh, pinching me to ask you, uh, if you permit me. Okay. You can ask uh, me. Thank you, Maharaj. I don't know if I can answer you, but you can ask me. Uh, Maharaj, uh, we have been talking, uh, or you have, your, your uh, uh, Holiness has been talking for Kota for some time, quite some time. Uh, is this uh, quota way of thinking will help or it is necessary in our devotional practice? Yes, it is. Because just like when we study Nectar of Instruction, they talk about Atyahara. Atyahara means overeating or overcollecting. Overcollecting over also. Yes. Overcollecting. Having more than than is actually necessary. You know, one house yeah. is not enough. One house is not enough. We need another house for the weekend. You know, we, we need a summer house. We need a house in the Holy Dam. When we go to the Holy Dam, we should have our own house. And we need another house for the children. And, oh, you know, endless. Very difficult to satisfy people. 
So we do have Good to enough. understand. We do have to understand about quota, and we should want to minimize that. We should try to minimize that quota, not to increase it more and more, but try to minimize it. Just like eating, oh. we say don't eat, don't eat too much, don't eat too little. Don't sleep too much, no. don't sleep too little. So quota. Don't don't have too much. Don't have too much. Not too much, not too little. I I can't hear that. What's that? What did he say? Mohanas, here one example I remember now, uh, Mother Teresa, she has said that one, that she said, my son, I have traveled, uh, me means uh, Mother Teresa, I have traveled almost all over the world. And one common problem I have seen everywhere is the uh, hunger. So she said, this hunger doesn't mean that your belly is, your stomach is empty. You stomach want some food, you feed them, it's fine. This hunger is our greediness. From top to bottom, you see when you are, everyone is hungry to accumulate. So the, I just remember, remember same have this quota, uh, has quote in this quota, because if you are as a devotee, if we focus so much on that, then I think our devotional practice will be changing our main goal. Yes. Yeah, devotional practice will definitely improve if we control our quota. And try to minimize the quota. We say there's enough for everyone's need, not enough for their greed. Yes. So this is a problem. This is why there has to be some quota. We have to be we have to be careful. We have to have some quota over things. Don't have too much. Don't have too little. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So I think we can start Maharaj, here. Yeah, Maharaj, just a small uh, query I want to uh, ask you, Maharaj. That uh, if someone uh, has, has doing over and over, and after over and over, if he whatsoever he gets, he uses in Krishna's service. So how we should uh, understand this? Oh. Well, over endeavor, he gets more than he needs, and he use, but he uses it in Krishna's service. Well, that's good, in a sense, that he used it for Krishna. He used a, but you have to be, you have to be a little cautious about over endeavoring because over endeavoring will have some effects on you that you over endeavored, maybe you, you know, you, you didn't do, didn't help your health very much because you over endeavored, you worked too hard, your health may have been affected. You may have, you may have spent less time with your family. So you're more distant from your family. Or you may have also had, uh, cut yourself off from relationships with others in the business or in the work. So over endeavoring does have effects on other people, not only on you, but on others also. So you have to be cautious about it. Even though you say you used it for Krishna, well, did Krishna need this? You know, okay, you used it for Krishna, that's nice, that at least you used it for Krishna. Not that Krishna needed it, because Krishna is self-satisfied. But the fact that you recognize that you gave it to Krishna, you recognize Krishna and gave it to him, that's good. So that, that helped. But I just worry that about the effects of the over endeavor, how it you know, reacted on other people. Okay, it's getting late. I think we have to Thank stop you. here. So we'll see you on Wednesday evening. 
Yes, Maharaj. If you have any more questions, just save them for then. Want to hear more participation from the ladies also? Okay. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Maharaj Ki Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhupada. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj.